Little Red Riding Hood Once upon a time, there lived a little girl who had a pretty red cape with a bright red hood. She always wore her red hooded cape, and that's why she was called Red Riding Hood. One day, her mother packed a basket with cakes and fruit. She said to Little Red Riding Hood, This is a gift for you to take to your grandmother. She's not well and will enjoy some nice cake and fruit. So, Little Red Riding Hood tied on her red cape and hood and set out for her grandmother's house. As she was going through the woods, she met a big wolf. The wolf spoke to her in a gruff voice. Good morning, little girl, he said. Where are you going with that nice basket of cake and fruits? I am going to visit my grandmother, Little Red Riding Hood said. She lives in the cottage at the other end of the woods. Well, well, said the wolf politely. I'm going to visit your grandmother too. <laughs> but I shall take the path across the meadow. I have business to attend to there. I'll see you. <laughs> at your grandmother's. The crafty old wolf knew where grandmother lived. He also knew that the path across the meadow was the shortest way to reach grandmother's house. Little Red Riding Hood stopped along the way to pick the bright flowers and to watch the butterflies flitting among the trees. So the wicked wolf was at grandmother's house long before Little Red Riding Hood got there. He crept up to the house very quietly. He peeked in the window. He saw grandmother sitting in her rocking chair, knitting a sweater for Little Red Riding Hood. But grandmother saw the wolf too. She jumped out of the chair. She slipped into the closet and locked the door behind her. She did it so quickly that the wolf didn't know what was happening. The big bad wolf was very angry. He came into the house. He rattled the closet door. Then the wolf spied grandmother's nightcap and her shawl hanging on a peg. Aha! cried the wolf. I'll put on grandmother's nightcap and shawl and get into bed. <laughs> Little Red Riding Hood will think that I'm her grandmother. Very soon, Little Red Riding Hood knocked on the door. <clears throat> Who's there? said the wolf, pretending to be grandmother. It is I, grandmother, said Little Red Riding Hood. C come, come in, my dear, said the wolf in his gentle voice. He drew the covers up around his chin. Oh, grandmother, declared Little Red Riding Hood, standing near the bed. What big, bright eyes you have. The better to see you with, <clears throat> my dear, said the wolf softly. Little Red Riding Hood came closer. Oh, grandmother, what big ears you have. The better to hear you with, my dear, said the wolf still more softly. Then Little Red Riding Hood saw the wolf's cruel, sharp teeth. Oh, grandmother, what big teeth you have, she whispered. The better to eat you with, my dear, cried the wolf. He pushed back the covers and jumped out of the bed.
then Little Red Riding Hood saw that it was the big wolf pretending to be her grandmother. At that moment, a hunter passed by the house. He heard the wolf's wicked voice and Little Red Riding Hood's frightened scream. He burst open the door. Before the wolf could reach Little Red Riding Hood, the hunter lifted his gun to his shoulder and killed the wicked wolf. Little Red Riding Hood was very happy and she thanked the kind hunter. Grandmother unlocked the door and came out of the closet where she had been hiding. She kissed Little Red Riding Hood again and again. And she thanked the hunter for saving them both from the big bad wolf. They were all so happy that they decided to have a party right then and there. Grandmother gave the hunter and Little Red Riding Hood a big glass of fresh milk and took one herself. They ate up all the cake and fruit that Little Red Riding Hood had brought to her grandmother. And they all lived happily ever after. The Three Little Pigs Once there were three little pigs who went out into the world to seek their fortunes. Each little pig took a different road. Soon, the first little pig met a man with a load of straw. Please, may I have some straw to build a house? Asked the little pig, and the man gave him some straw. The first little pig had just finished his house when a big, bad wolf came along. Little pig, little pig, let me come in said the wolf. No, no, not by the hair on my chinny chin chin, said the little pig. Then I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house in, cried the wolf. So he huffed and he puffed and he the second little pig met a man with a bundle of twigs. Please, may I have some twigs to build a house? Asked the little pig, and the man gave him some twigs. But no sooner had the second little pig finished his house than the big, bad wolf came to call. Little pig, little pig, let me come in, said the wolf. No, no, not by the hair on my chinny chin chin, said the little pig. Then I'll huff, and I'll puff, and I'll blow your house in cried the wolf. So he huffed, and he puffed, and he huffed, and he puffed, and he blew that house. Now, the third little pig met a man with a wheelbarrow full of bricks. Please, may I have some bricks to build a house? asked the little pig, and the man gave him some bricks. But no sooner had the third little pig finished his house than the big, bad wolf came along. Little pig, mm, little pig, let me come in, he cried. No, no, not by the hair on my chinny chin chin, said the little pig. Then I'll huff, and I'll puff, and I'll blow your house in, cried the wolf. So he huffed, and he puffed, and he huffed, and he puffed, and then he huffed, and he puffed some more. 
<laughs> but he could not blow the house in. The wolf was very angry and thought to himself, I must catch that little pig. So he said, There are some nice fat turnips in Farmer Brown's field. Will you go with me to get some at six o'clock tomorrow morning, little pig? Yes, I will, said the pig. But he got up at five o'clock and was home cooking his turnips when the wolf came to call for him. The big bad wolf was very, very angry. But he thought of another way to catch the little pig. I know where there's a fine red apple tree. Will you go with me at five o'clock tomorrow morning to pick some apples? Yes, I will, said the little pig. But the little pig went for the apples at four o'clock. He had not started early enough, however, and he was still up in the tree when the wolf came along. Are the apples sweet? asked the wolf. Yes, said the little pig. I will throw you one. So he threw an apple as far as he could and while the wolf went to get it, the little pig climbed down the tree and ran home. Early the next morning, the wolf hurried to the little pig's house. He had to catch that pig. So he climbed up on the roof and slid down the chimney. But the little pig had seen him coming and took the lid off a large kettle of water which was on the fire. There was a great big splash! And that was the end of the big bad wolf. The Wolf and the Seven Lambs once there lived a goat along with her seven kids near a forest. She loved her kids very much. One day, while the goat was going to collect food for her kids, she said to them, Kids, I'm going to the forest to bring food. You should not quarrel and listen. Do not open the door for anyone except me. The wolf always eyes you greedily. She kissed her kids and said goodbye. The wolf was already waiting for the goat to depart. He was very fond of the lamb's flesh. He went to the hut of the goat and knocked at the door. <clears throat> Hello, kids. Here is your mother. <laughs> Open the door. I have brought good food for you. The kids were intelligent. They recognized the voice of the wolf and said, Oh, wicked wolf, do not try to fool off. Go away! Then the wolf practiced speaking like the goat and came again. This time he spoke in a loud voice. Hello, kids. <laughs> Open the door. It is your mother here. Be quick. The kids were intelligent. They peeped through the magic glass of the door cautiously. Seeing the feet of the wolf, they said, No, we will not open the door. We have recognized you. Your feet are different from those of our mothers. The color of her feet is white. Hearing the kids made the wolf go to a grocer's shop and he asked him to cover his feet with white flour. The shopkeeper was surprised to hear the strange demand of the wolf, but out of fear, he sprinkled some flour on his feet. Thus, the feet of the wolf became white. He came back to the hut of the goat and knocked at the door. <clears throat> Hello, 
dear children, I have come. <laughs> Open the door quickly. The kids peeped through the magic glass and found the color of the feet white. They opened the door. But seeing the wolf made them run here and there to save their lives. Some went under the bed while some hid behind the curtains. But the cunning wolf caught and ate up all of them except one who had hidden himself in the big clock of the house. The wolf just could not guess that hideout. After some time, when the goat returned to the hut, she was surprised to see the door wide open. She had thought that the kids would be very happy to eat the fresh food, but her happiness soon vanished. She found that the whole house had been ransacked and none of her kids could be seen. She wept and cried bitterly and said, Oh, kids! What happened to you all? Why did you open the door for a stranger? The wolf has won the fight, and I have lost to him. At this moment, the kid who was inside the clock spoke. Mother, are you listening to me, the youngest of all? Take me out of the clock. The goat immediately picked up her little kid and kissed her again and again. The kid told her of the whole incident. Then they heard the snoring of the wolf. The goat said, It appears that the wolf is still here. Bring the long scissors. The kid brought the scissors. They both went to the garden. They found the wolf sleeping there. The goat went up to the wolf slowly and cut open his belly. She found the kids alive and took them out one by one from the wolf's belly. The goat hugged the kids warmly. Then she asked all the kids to put stones in the wolf's belly. They all picked up big stones and put them in the wolf's stomach. Then the goat stitched up the belly and they all came back to their hut. Soon the wolf awoke and felt thirsty. He got up and went to the well to drink water. As there were stones in his belly, he couldn't balance himself and fell into the well with a loud noise. He died by drowning in the deep water. The goat and her kids were observing everything from the window. Now they all came out of the hut and danced. They needn't be afraid of the wolf anymore. Goldilocks and the Three Bears once there were three bears who lived in a little house in the woods. The father was a great big bear. The mother was a middle-sized bear. And the child was a teeny tiny bear. One day, while their porridge was left on the table to cool, they went for a walk. Along came a little girl named Goldilocks. She knocked at the door, but no one answered. She walked in, and there she saw the three bowls of porridge on the table. I am very hungry, thought Goldilocks. First, she tasted the porridge in the great big bowl, but it was too hot. Then she tasted the porridge in the middle-sized bowl, but it was too cool. Then she tasted the porridge in the teeny tiny bowl, and it was just right. So she ate it all up. After that, Goldilocks went into another room, and there she saw three chairs. First, she sat down in the great big chair, but it was too high. Then she sat down in the middle-sized chair, but it was too low. 
Then she sat down in the teeny tiny chair and she said, that is just right. And Goldilocks sat down so hard that the bottom of the chair fell out. After that, Goldilocks went up to the bedroom and there she saw three beds. First, she tried the great big bed, but it was too hard. Then she tried the middle-sized bed, but it was too soft. But when she lay down on the teeny tiny bed, it was just right. Goldilocks fell fast asleep. While she was sleeping, the three bears returned from their walk. They looked about. Someone has been tasting my porridge, said the great big bear in a great big voice. Someone has been tasting my porridge, said the middle-sized bear in the middle-sized voice. Someone has been tasting my porridge and has eaten it all up said the teeny tiny bear in a teeny tiny voice. Then the three bears went into the next room, which was the parlor. Someone has been sitting in my chair, said the great big bear in a great big voice. Someone has been sitting in my chair, said the middle-sized bear in the middle-sized voice. Someone has been sitting in my chair and it's all broken, said the teeny tiny bear in a teeny tiny voice. Then the three bears went upstairs to the bedroom. Someone has been lying in my bed, said the great big bear in a great big voice. Someone has been lying in my bed bed, said the middle-sized bear in the middle-sized voice. Someone has been lying in my bed, and here she is, said the teeny tiny bear in a teeny tiny voice. The voices woke up Goldilocks, and when she saw the three bears staring at her, she jumped out of the window and luckily landed in a pile of soft leaves. Then she ran home as fast as her legs would carry her. The Elves and the Shoemaker There was once a long time ago an honest and hard-working shoemaker who through no fault of his own grew so poor that he had nothing left in the world but enough leather to make only one pair of shoes. He cut the shoes out before he went to bed that night thinking that he would finish them the next day. Rising early the next morning, he hurried to his workbench and found to his amazement that the shoes were already made and finished. He took them in hand and examined them closely. There was not one false stitch in the whole job. All was so neat and true that it could only have been done by a master workman. The shoemaker called to his wife excitedly and she hurried in to marvel also at the excellent workmanship though she could not explain how it had come about. Some time later, a man came into the shop and tried on the shoes. They are the most comfortable shoes I have ever worn, he exclaimed, and so pleased was he with their good looks that he gladly paid more than the usual price for them. The poor shoemaker promptly went out to buy more leather, which, as it turned out, was enough to make two more pairs of shoes. That evening, he cut out the shoes and laid them out neatly so that he could begin afresh the next day. 
Imagine his joy and surprise the next morning to discover that he was saved all the trouble. The work was already done. Soon after, two customers came in and bought both pairs of shoes. What fine stitches! They exclaimed, and how well they are made! Now the shoemaker had money enough to buy leather for four pairs of shoes, which of course he did. The next morning, four pairs of neatly finished shoes were ready as the shoemaker entered his shop. And so it went on for some time. Whatever was cut out in the evening was worked up by daybreak, and customers came in eagerly to buy the shoes. Soon, the shoemaker and his wife were not poor anymore. One evening, just before Christmas, when he had cut out some shoes as usual, the shoemaker said to his wife, "Let us stay up tonight." To see who it is that helps us in this fine way, the wife agreed readily, and so, leaving a dim light burning, they hid themselves in a corner of the room, behind a curtain. At the stroke of midnight, two little elves came in. They sat down at the shoemaker's bench. Took up all the work that was cut out, and soon their tiny fingers began to stitch and sew and hammer so quickly that the shoemaker's eyes opened wide in wonderment. They never stopped for a moment until everything was finished. Then they arranged the shoes in neat little rows on the bench, and they scampered away. As quickly and as silently as mice. The next morning, the shoemaker's wife said to her husband, "The little men have made us rich, and we should show our gratitude by doing something for them." Did you notice that they wore no clothes, with not a thing to cover them? They must be very cold. I'll make them shirts and coats and trousers and hats and perhaps even knit them a pair of stockings. You shall make each of them a tiny pair of shoes. A wonderful plan," agreed the shoemaker. They both went to work, and by the end of the day, the presents were ready. Then, instead of the cut-out work which was usually placed on the bench, the good couple laid out the gifts and hid themselves to await the coming of the little men. At midnight, the elves came in, hopping and skipping and looking about for the leather. When they found the neat little garments that had been put out for them, oh, they laughed and chuckled with delight. They dressed themselves in the twinkling of an eye, and then they danced and capered about, singing, "Tonight we do not need to sew. We have fine clothes, so off we'll go." And with that. They danced out of the door and over the green, laughing merrily. The shoemaker and his wife never saw them again, but the good luck that the elves had brought remained with them for the rest of their lives. The Pied Piper of Hamelin. Hamelin was a small town in Germany. The city was full of rats. Hamelin was truly a rat's paradise. They were in houses, in inns, in shops, in schools, and in every street. It was a menace, and a solution had to be found fast. The mayor had often held meetings with the town folks to discuss the problem. In the beginning, they had thought that cats would drive away the rats. However, the number of rats became quite a problem for them. It was very tough to take proper steps 
as it was very difficult to find huge numbers of cats. They were in a real dilemma. One day, a stranger came to the town of Hamelin. He carried a flute along with him. He had a stern look on his face and walked straight to the mayor's building. He faced the mayor of Hamelin and said, It is well known around Germany that Hamelin has a problem with rats. I will get rid of all the rats. What would my reward be? For a moment, the mayor was stunned. It was difficult for him to believe that a stranger who was coming from somewhere else suddenly was claiming he could drive away all the rats from his city. Ten thousand gold coins from our treasury, if you can do as you promise, said the mayor. The stranger nodded his head and said, In a day's time, Hamelin will have no rats. The stranger walked out in the street, pulled out his flute, and started playing it. An eerie sound floated in the air. The people of Hamelin could hear the beautiful tune from every corner of Hamelin and were paralyzed hearing this enchanting tone. All of a sudden, there was a whirring noise. Thousands of rats came from various directions. They followed the eerie sound that came from the piper's flute. It seemed that the rats were mesmerized with the delightful tone of the flute. The stranger headed towards the sea with all the rats of Hamelin behind him. It was an extraordinary sight for the folks of Hamelin. The stranger was continuously playing the flute and walked right into the sea. The rats followed him and all of them were caught by the waves which dragged them into the sea. All the rats of Hamelin drowned. The strange piper had gotten rid of all the rats and kept his promise. The stranger approached the mayor for his reward. The mayor and the townspeople rejoiced watching the bizarre thing, but the mayor had changed his mind. When the stranger went to him, he said, It is a wonderful task you have accomplished, but isn't 10,000 gold coins a hefty reward for a day's work? I will pay you 500 gold coins. Hmm. The stranger looked at the mayor and then walked out. In the street, he pulled out his flute again and started playing it. This time, the sound that came from the flute was different, but was eerie as well. All the children of Hamelin started to follow the stranger. The stranger walked out of town and disappeared into the mountains. The children followed him. The parents of the children wept. Where had the stranger taken their children? They went to the mayor and complained about it. The mayor was helpless. He knew that he had been dishonest with the stranger. The stranger returned to Hamelin, but the children didn't accompany him. The mayor rushed to him, begging for forgiveness. He pleaded to the stranger to get the children back. Without uttering a single word, the stranger turned and walked away. He returned after a few hours this time with all the children. The stranger was rewarded with his 10,000 gold coins. The mayor had learned his lesson. Hansel and Gretel Hansel and Gretel lived with her father and stepmother in a little cottage near a forest. The father was a poor woodcutter. Once when food was scarce, he said to his wife, What will become of us? We have so little to eat. 
I am afraid the children will starve. Now, the stepmother was really a witch, and she did not love the children, and she wanted to get rid of them. After the children went to bed, she said to their father, Tomorrow morning, we will take Hansel and Gretel into the forest and leave them there. They will not be able to find their way home again and we will not have to worry about them anymore. Oh no, cried the father. I cannot do that to my poor children. But the wicked stepmother forced him to agree to the plan. In the next room, the children were still awake. They heard what their stepmother was planning to do. We are lost, cried Gretel, weeping bitterly. But Hansel comforted her. Don't cry, Gretel, he said. I shall take care of you. I will think of something. Later that night, Hansel put on his jacket and slipped out the back door. In the bright moonlight, the pebbles in front of the house glistened like bits of silver. Hansel stuffed his pockets full of the pebbles and then went back to bed. Before the sun rose the next morning, the stepmother awakened the children. Get up, she said. We are all going to the forest to cut wood. Before they left the house, she gave each of the children a piece of bread. Save it for your supper, she told them. You will not get any more to eat. When they started out for the forest, Hansel lagged behind the rest. At every few steps, he dropped a pebble on the ground behind him. Hansel, cried the father, looking around. Why are you so slow? Oh, I was just turning around to look at my little white kitten sitting up on the roof, said Hansel. She is saying goodbye to me. Come along, cried the stepmother irritably. That's not a kitten. It's the sunshine gleaming on the roof. At last, they were deep in the forest. The father told Hansel and Gretel to gather wood to make a fire. When the father had made a good fire, he told the children to sit near it and keep warm. We are going to chop wood, said the stepmother. We will come back later and get you. So the children sat by the fire, and to pass the time, they sang their favorite song. Susie, dear Susie, come tell me the news. The geese are all barefoot, they must have some shoes. The cobbler has leather enough and to spare. Let's ask him to make our poor goosey a pair. Then they ate their bread and fell fast asleep. It was dark when the children woke up. Gretel was frightened and began to cry. Don't worry, said Hansel. When the moon comes up, we will find our way home by following the pebbles I dropped. And that is just what they did. When they got home, their father was overjoyed to see them. There is some food in the house again, he said and then he gave them a good breakfast. Oh, but the stepmother still wanted to get rid of the children. She waited until they had no food left. Then she made her husband agree to take the children deeper into the forest. Here is your supper, she said. And again, she gave each of them a crust of bread. 
this time, Hansel had not been able to gather any pebbles, so he made crumbs out of his crust of bread and dropped them along the path. We will find our way back by following the crumbs, he whispered to Gretel. But alas, when morning came, they could not find any breadcrumbs. The birds had eaten them. The children started to walk through the forest. They walked all day. At last, they stopped to rest beneath a tree. They saw a lovely white bird sitting on a branch, singing sweetly. When the bird flew away, they followed him. Suddenly, Hansel and Gretel came upon a little cottage. It was made of gingerbread, and the windows were of transparent sugar. There were cookies and cakes and candy all over the outside of the house, and the roof was covered with, hmm, vanilla icing. They ran towards it eagerly. Hansel broke off a chocolate cookie, and Gretel tasted some of the window. Ooh, what a fine meal we will have, they said happily. Just then, a shrill voice called out from the cottage. Nibble, nibble like a mouse. Who is nibbling at my house? The children answered, It's only the wind, the wind. Just then, the door opened and out came a bent old woman leaning on a cane. Don't be frightened, said the old woman sweetly to the children. Come inside and have a proper meal. I know you must be hungry and tired. She took the children into the house and gave them each a dish heaped with pancake and a big glass of milk. I live here all alone, said the old woman and I am happy to have company. After the children had eaten, she put them to bed. They soon fell fast asleep in the two clean beds. Now, this old woman who seemed to be kind was really a wicked witch. She enticed children to her gingerbread house, and then she kept them prisoners until she ate them. After Hansel and Gretel were asleep, the witch sat before her pot and sang to herself, My, what a splendid feast I've got! I'll boil these children in my pot! First I will fatten up the boy, <laughs> and then the little girl in <laughs> From time to time, she would look at the two rosy-cheeked children peacefully asleep. The next day, the witch took Hansel by the hand and led him to a little cage in her stable. Before he knew what was happening, she had pushed him in and locked the cage door. Then the witch said to Gretel, now you will do my housework. <laughs> but first, fetch some water and cook some food to fatten up your brother. When he is fat enough, I shall eat him. <laughs> Gretel cried bitterly, but she had to do as she was told. Every day she gave Hansel the best food, but she herself got only the leavings and crusts. Every day the witch went up to the cage to see if Hansel was fat enough. Stretch out your finger, she would tell Hansel, so that I can see if you are fat enough. But the witch had very bad eyesight, so instead of holding out his finger, Hansel held out a lean chicken bone. He never seemed to be any fat. After a few weeks passed, the witch became angry. Enough, she cried. Gretel, draw the water and boil the pot. Be he fat or be he lean, tomorrow I shall feast on him. <laughs> 
Gretel cried and begged, but the old witch had no mercy. The next day, the witch said to Gretel, While the pot is boiling, we will do the baking. I have heated the oven. Pushing Gretel to the oven, she said, Climb in and see if it is hot enough now to bake the bread. <laughs> but Gretel knew what the witch had in mind, so she said, I don't know how to climb in. Will you show me how? Silly goose, cried the witch. The opening is big enough. Why, I could climb in myself. And the witch climbed into the oven. At that moment, Gretel slammed the door shut. Now Gretel jumped with joy and sang out, Now you're in the oven and I'm out here. i let out my brother and then we'll both cheer. <laughs> Gretel rushed to the cage and opened the door to let Hansel out. They hugged each other for joy. Then the two children went through the witch's house and found chests of gold and jewels. While they were filling their pockets, their father rushed into the cottage. My children, he cried, I have been searching all over for you. I have come to take you home again. And then he told the children that their stepmother had gone away forever. She had probably gone to join the other witches, he said. And that is where she belongs. So Hansel and Gretel and their father went home with plenty of gold. They never went hungry again. And they all lived happily ever after, never wishing for anything. Pinocchio. Once upon a time, there lived a poor and lonely woodcutter named Geppetto. One day, Geppetto found a fine log of wood, and he decided to make a puppet to keep him company. He carved a little boy out of the wood and called him Pinocchio. Geppetto loved Pinocchio as much as if he were a real child. He wanted to send Pinocchio to school and bring him up properly. But Pinocchio started out as a naughty little puppet. The first thing he did as soon as he learned how to walk on his wooden legs was to run away. Geppetto set out to look for Pinocchio but he could not find him. Meanwhile, a policeman caught Pinocchio by his nose, but he wriggled away and ran back home. There was no one at home because Geppetto was still out looking for him. Suddenly, a voice cried, Cree, Cree, Cree. Who said that? Asked Pinocchio in a frightened voice. I did, said the talking cricket, crawling slowly up the wall. Shame on boys who run away from home. You should go to school or you will grow up to be a donkey. Go away, shouted Pinocchio. The cricket stepped through the window and was gone. Pinocchio was hungry, for he had not eaten anything all day. He went about the room, pulling out drawers, looking for something to eat. He saw something in a corner and picked it up. It was an egg. Now I shall have something to eat, he said. But when he broke the eggshell, a little chicken popped out. Thank you, Master Pinocchio, it said politely. You have saved me the trouble of breaking my shell. Goodbye. And the chicken flew away. Pinocchio began to cry. Oh dear, he said. If only I had been good and not run away. My dear papa would be here now with something for me to eat. 
He sat down in front of the fireplace and stretched out his legs to warm them. He fell fast asleep, and when he woke up, his wooden feet were burned off. Oh, how Pinocchio cried. Just then, Geppetto came back. He was overjoyed to see his little boy again and kissed him. I can make you new feet, he said. But then you would run away again. No, I won't, Pinocchio promised. I'll be good and go to school. So Geppetto took his tools and made two nice new feet for Pinocchio. Then he made some clothes for him. But there was no money for a school book for Pinocchio. So Geppetto went out and sold his overcoat to buy a school book. Pinocchio kissed his dear father and started off to school. He really meant to be good. But alas, on the way to school, Pinocchio passed a big tent. There was a puppet show going on inside. Pinocchio sold his school book to a peddler for a ticket to the show. And in he went. A showman called Fire Eater saw Pinocchio. He said, Bring that puppet here. He is made of fine dry wood and will make a good blaze for my roast. The cook brought Pinocchio, who was wriggling and screaming. When Fire Eater saw Pinocchio cry, he felt sorry for him. Pinocchio told him all his troubles and how poor Geppetto had sold his overcoat to buy him a school book. Fire Eater said, Here are five gold pieces. Buy your father a new overcoat and yourself a new school book. Pinocchio started down the road towards home. He jingled the five gold pieces in his pocket. But also he met with some bad companions on the way. He stopped to talk to two beggars, a fox and a cat. Look, I am rich, said Pinocchio, pulling the five gold pieces out of his pocket. The fox and the cat opened their eyes. Hmm, what will you do with all that money? They asked. I am going to buy my father a new overcoat and myself a school book. It's silly to go to school, said the fox. You must be hungry. Why don't you have dinner with us at the inn? Cree, 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 said a small voice nearby among the weeds. Don't listen to bad companions. Pinocchio knew it was the voice of the talking cricket, but he did not want to listen. Instead, he went with the fox and the cat. The fox had rabbit stew, the cat had fried fish, and Pinocchio had spaghetti. But Pinocchio fell asleep with his plate of spaghetti half eaten. When he woke up, the fox and cat were gone. He had to pay a gold coin to the innkeeper for their dinners. Anyway, I have the other four gold coins, said Pinocchio to himself. It was past midnight when Pinocchio left the inn. As he walked along the dark road, he heard the sound of running feet behind him. In the moonlight, Pinocchio saw two creatures dressed in black running after him. They wore black sacks which covered them all over. Only their eyes gleamed through holes cut in the sacks. They were the fox and cat in disguise. Give us your money, they hissed. But Pinocchio ran 
and ran. He jumped across a little brook. The fox and cat could not jump because they were tied up in their sacks. So they landed splash right in the middle of the brook. Soon it was morning. As Pinocchio ran through the woods, he saw a little white house. A lovely fairy with gold hair was sitting in the window. She let him in and asked, What seems to be the trouble? Pinocchio told the fairy everything that had happened since he had left home to go to school. Where are the rest of the gold coins? She asked. Pinocchio had the gold coins in his pocket. Mm, but he lied to the fairy. I... I lost them, he said. As soon as he said this, his nose began to grow longer. Where did you lose the gold coins? Asked the fairy. In the forest, lied Pinocchio. At this second lie, his nose grew even longer. Then we will go find them, said the fairy. No, said Pinocchio quickly. I, I swallowed them. At this third lie, his nose grew so long that it reached clear across the room and out of the window. Pinocchio could not go through the door with it. The fairy watched while Pinocchio tried to move this way and that with his long nose. Then, feeling that he had been punished enough for telling lies, she called to a great flock of woodpeckers. The birds came in. They perched on his nose and began peck, peck, peck at last. Pinocchio's nose was down to its right size. Now, said the fairy, if you promise to be a good boy all the time, you may have one wish. I wish to be a real boy, cried Pinocchio. You will have your wish presently, said the fairy. What a good fairy you are said Pinocchio. Now I must go home to my father, Geppetto. Go then and be a good boy and never lie again. Each time you tell a lie, your nose will grow longer, said the fairy as she kissed him goodbye. Pinocchio ran home to Geppetto who was overjoyed to see him. When Pinocchio awoke the next morning, he found that he was no longer a puppet, but a real boy. How silly and naughty I was when I was a puppet! How glad I am now that I am a well-behaved boy, he said. From that day on, Pinocchio and Geppetto lived happily ever after. Rumpelstiltskin Once there was a poor miller who had a very beautiful daughter. One day he went to the king's court and claimed that his daughter could spin straw into gold. The king ordered the miller's daughter to come to the palace. He took her to a room full of straw and said to her, You must spin all this straw into gold tonight or you shall die. Miller's daughter was locked in the room alone. She did not know what to do and began to cry. <laughs> Suddenly, a dwarf came out of nowhere and asked her, Why are you crying? When she told him the story, he said, Don't worry, I'll spin the straw into gold, but what will you give me in return? I will give you my necklace, she promised. The dwarf spun all the straw into gold. The next day, when the king saw this, he was astonished and pleased. He became greedier. 
he took the girl to a bigger room and said, Spin all this straw into gold or you shall die. She was locked inside again and once again she began to cry. The tiny man came into the room once more. He said, If I spin all the straw into gold, what will you give me this time? She gave him her gold ring and he sat through the night and spun all the straw into gold. The third morning, the king was very happy to see the room full of gold. He took her to the biggest room filled with straw and said, If you spin all this straw into gold, you shall become my wife. The girl was locked up and once again, she began to cry. <laughs> this time, when the little man came to her, she said, I don't have anything to give you, sir. What will I do? He said, Promise me that you will give me your firstborn child when you become the queen. The girl agreed to do so because she was not expecting to become the king's wife. The tiny man spun all the straw into gold in the night. The next day, the king was pleased to see the gold. He married the girl and soon they had a baby. The tiny man came to the queen to take her baby away, but she had forgotten about the promise. She cried and begged him to leave her baby alone. The tiny man said, I will not take your baby if you can guess my name. I'll give you three days. Saying this, he disappeared. The queen tried to remember all kinds of names. The next night when he came, she told him all the uncommon names that she could think of. Mm, let's see, perhaps your name is Timothy, hmm, Benjamin, or Jeremiah. But he always answered, That is not my name. The next day, the queen sent her servants all over the country to get all the possible names of the people. That night, the dwarf came to the queen again, but she could not guess his real name. On the third day, one of the queen's servants went into the forest to find the little man. Deep in the woods, the servant found him dancing and singing happily in front of a fire. He sang, Today I bake, tomorrow I brew, the next I'll have the young queen's child. <laughs> Glad am I that no one knew. That rumple stilt skin I am styled. The servant went back to the palace and told the queen the name of the dwarf. That night when the little man came to the queen, she was already prepared. The tiny man challenged, Do you give up? Shall I take your child away? The queen smiled and replied, Is your name? Harry? Is it Conrad? <laughs> Perhaps it is Rumpelstiltskin. <gasps> Hearing his name, the tiny man screamed, How could you possibly know my name? Saying this, he ran away deep into the forest, never to be seen again. The Princess and the Pea A long time ago, in a land far away, there lived a king and queen who had just one son. The prince was grown up, and it was time for him to marry a princess. And she must be a real princess, the prince told the king and queen. But there were no princesses in the land where he lived. So the king and queen arranged for the prince to travel to strange and distant lands to find a bride. The prince traveled north through frozen lands until he came to a castle where a princess lived. 
This princess was tall and fair and very clever, but she was also vain and boastful. A real princess would not be boastful, thought the prince. So he traveled south through hot, sandy deserts until he came to a palace where a princess lived. This princess was very beautiful, but also very proud. A real princess would not be so proud, thought the prince. So he traveled east through misty lands until he came to a mansion where a princess lived. This princess had a charming smile and a lovely voice, but she told the most shocking lies. A real princess would never tell lies, thought the prince. So he returned home from his travels, weary, sad, and lonely. One evening, not long after the prince had come home, a terrible storm blew in from the west. Suddenly, there was a knock at the palace door. The king was so surprised that he went to answer it himself. There, standing in the windy doorway, was the most bedraggled young woman the king had ever seen. Good evening, your majesty, she said to the king, curtsying politely. I am a princess and I need shelter for the night. May I please come in? No, of course, said the king. We will gladly give you shelter for the night. When the king told the prince that a princess had turned up at the door, the prince was very eager to meet her, but the queen told him he would have to wait. The princess said that she couldn't possibly meet you wet and bedraggled, the queen explained. She has gone to have a bath and change into some dry clothes. That's a good sign, said the prince. But how can we be certain that she is a real princess? I have an idea said his mother. Leave everything to me. A short while later, the princess arrived in the main hall dressed in the queen's clothes. Her hair shone, her cheeks were rosy, and her eyes sparkled merrily to match her smile. The prince and princess sat beside the fire and talked for hours. The prince was enchanted, but he still wasn't sure that the princess was a real princess. Meanwhile, the queen went to the best guest bedroom carrying a single tiny dried pea. In the bedroom, she put the pea under the mattress. Then she asked a servant to bring another mattress to put on top of the first, and then another mattress, and another, until there were 20 mattresses on the bed. Then the queen told the servant to put 20 soft, cozy quilts on top of the mattresses and had a ladder brought for the princess. The princess was surprised when the queen brought her to the bedroom with its towering bed and ladder, but she didn't protest or complain. She thanked the queen and wished her good night. The princess climbed the ladder to the very top of the bed. Sighing contentedly, she settled down to sleep. But the princess did not sleep a wink. Mm, she tossed and turned all night. By morning, the princess felt tired and weary. When she came down to breakfast, the prince, the king, and the queen greeted her eagerly. Did you sleep well? asked the queen. I'm afraid not, sighed the princess. There was something small and hard in the bed, and no matter which way I turned, I still felt it. Oh, I'm dreadfully tired, for I hardly slept at all. I'm so sorry, said the queen. But I'm delighted, too, for this proves that you are indeed a real princess. Only a real princess would feel a tiny pea. 
under 20 mattresses and 20 quilts. The prince was overjoyed, for he had already fallen in love with the princess, and she had fallen in love with him. And so they were married. And what happened to the pea? It was put on a velvet cushion in a glass case and sent to the museum, where it's still on display today. Come on, little bunnies. Give thumbs up for the video, share with your friends, and subscribe to our channel for more awesome videos.